Welcome everybody to the uh, to the um, uh, Field Institute COVID seminar and a special welcome to all our friends from uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada. This in fact is a special joint session uh, between PHAC and the Field Institute. Uh, their seminar is called the PHAC Deep Dive Seminar and we're, we're not that ambitious, but we just, um, we just call it in the field uh, COVID seminar, the math of COVID seminar. So we have a, a, a guest today, uh, Bruce Melardo, uh, and he will speak about from the discovery of the Higgs boson to modeling the COVID-19 pandemic. Sounds like it's going to be a very eclectic and very informative talk. I look forward to it. Uh, as usual, we will uh, let Bruce uh, give his talk and then we will uh, uh, save our questions for the end. Um, and John Hong will moderate the, uh, the Q&A. Thank you, Bruce, please. Right, can you see the slides and- Yes, we can. Hear me? All right, thanks Kumar uh, for the introduction and thanks a lot for the invitation. So as the, the, the title reads, I'm gonna start talking about the heat discovery and why us and uh, why we are doing modeling for COVID-19 uh, in the South African context. Um, so I'll, I'll start quickly uh, with an introduction as to what uh, what is the relationship between the Higgs boson and matter. And I will say a few words about the discovery of the Higgs boson at the LHC and how it is connected and it was connected with uh, big data and artificial intelligence, which answers the question, why us? Now, the, the pandemic broke out uh, in South Africa beginning of 2020 and uh, our Department of Science and Innovation, other stakeholders uh, asked uh, experts in, in data analytics, such as as us, uh, to answer certain questions. And I was invited uh, by the Premier of the Houghton Province uh, to serve in the advisory committee to lead modeling efforts uh, for the province. Um, for those that are not familiar with uh, South African geography, Houghton is the most populous province in the country. Uh, and hosts Johannesburg and Pretoria. So I will go through some of the projects we delivered and some of the functionality of those projects. And this, this talk is more geared towards uh, a broad audience that includes policymakers. And, and I will, my understanding is that you do have uh, people in the audience uh, in, in that space. Uh, so uh, matter, everybody knows that matter is made of atoms and but uh, atoms have structure. Inside the atom, you have the nucleus, and around the nucleus, you have an electron. We also know uh, that the nucleus has a structure. It's made of protons and uh, uh, neutrons. And then somewhere around uh, mid 20th century, we figure out that the proton has a structure as well. So what we think today, uh, 21st century, is the structure of matter is basically the constituents of the protons called quarks and leptons, which is electrons and its heavier cousins that float around uh, the atom. So the, the, the standard model of, of, of fundamental interactions that explains known matter in the universe uh, is the result of this compact um, uh, collection of, of matter made of quarks and leptons that is organized in three generations where particles become heavier when you go from left uh, to right. So that's really in a very compact fashion what we think matter is made of and how matter uh, will interact. Now the Higgs boson, which as you know, was discovered in 2012 and was postulated in 1964. So it took about 50 years to find and generations of scientists plays a, a central and critical role in the theory because particles have mass. These are massive uh, objects in nature, both those that are, uh, that matter uh, uh, is composed of and the carriers of those forces that are the result of the exchange um, between uh, quarks and leptons. And the Higgs boson plays this fundamental role that through electric stability breaking, it allows to create masses naturally uh, while maintaining the, the theory uh, to be self-consistent. So that plays a very critical role. That's why the Higgs boson uh, has been uh, uh, looked after for basically five decades. And finally it was discovered uh, in 2012. 
Now, after many attempts uh, since uh, the 70s and, and late 60s to find this mischievous particle that is able uh, to provide mass to elementary particles um, was, uh, was found. The Large Hadron Collider is one of these instruments that were designed for that. Uh, let's uh, remind ourselves that this is a mega project that was conceived in the 80s, that was designed in the 90s and constructed in the 2000s. And it started taking data in 2010. And it's a bunch of, acceler it's an accelerator, it's a bunch of magnets, um, dipoles, quadrupoles, sextupoles, octopoles that are there in order to bend protons uh, very close to the speed of light and to focus them uh, in, in very small space, so as to create uh, collisions head-on of protons. Um, the, the complex has a bunch of caverns that are filled by experiments, and uh, South Africa contributes to the ALICE, ACLES, uh, and is all the experiments, and also has a contribution uh, to theoretical developments at CERN. Um, the experiment that we are pa a part of is ACLES, and that's one of the two that discover the Higgs boson, just as a reminder. The Higgs boson was discovered by the CMS experiment here and the ATLAS uh, experiment, which were designed uh, to observe the Higgs boson. Now, what we do in collider physics is we have magnets and uh, cavities that would accelerate particles, in this case, protons. Then protons are going to be flying very close to the speed of light in clouds, and they're going to go through each other. And as clouds go through each other, you're going to have head-on collisions of protons. And as I said earlier, protons are made of partons. So what really collides are the partons, the quarks that are inside um, the, or the gluons that are inside the proton. And following the famous equation of special relativity, if you, in, if you inject energy, you may come up with mass. You're going to create something massive. And that's how the Higgs boson is created. It decays very rapidly. And what we actually observed experimentally uh, by the detectors is the decay of these uh, Higgs boson particles, which happens very, very rarely. And this is why you need very advanced analytics techniques, uh, such as artificial intelligence through machine learning to really do uh, this uh, very complicated search. Now, the Atos detector uh, that I just spoke about sits at about 100 meters below the surface uh, in the Geneva area, the boundary between France and Switzerland. And you see here basically the tunnels where protons circulate clockwise and counterclockwise. You have a massive detector, which is about 25 meters high and 40 meters long. And you can think of a detector in our field as a very complicated camera taking a lot of data 40 million times a second. So this is really the mother. Uh, and remember, this was designed back, back in the 90s. So imagine. The, 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 the forward thinking that people had in terms of dealing with the big data problem and giving solutions to the processing of such huge amounts of data. We're talking about um, petabytes of data per second. So imagine the amount of work that, that and the amount of thinking that goes in, into that. So this graph here is an schematic representation of detectors. You zoom in uh, into the picture I just showed before. And uh, you, you take apart the subsystems that are not needed in order to see what happened inside this collision. So you have protons coming from the right, if you follow my mouse, and from the left uh, meeting at the center of the detector. And then very rarely, but uh, copiously enough, uh, you have two protons colliding head on, giving rise to a Higgs boson. And that Higgs boson decays into a spectacular type of configuration where you have four muons. A muon is the heavy casting of the electron, is, is this lepton. You are basically, you follow the trajectory of the muons as they fly away from the collision or interaction point that you have a number of measurements that determine its momentum, determine its position, its angle, and, and also uh, determines with a high level of confidence that that was indeed a muon that came from this point. It's a very sophisticated thing. And, and this, of course, in order to get to this graph, obviously you had generations of, of people, thousands of people contributing to this very complex uh, device. So this is a graph, it's an animation of how the data was being collected in 2011. 
uh, leading up to uh, 2012 and the accumulation of all the data necessary for the discover the Higgs boson. So now, even with machine learning, we can't really tell on an event by event basis or a collision by collision basis whether that uh, event is consistent with a Higgs boson. We cannot say that this data here was the Higgs boson, but we can say statistically that uh, we that the background only hypothesis, which is in red, which means what we know exists in nature, but without the Higgs boson was completely unable to describe the data. And that's how you uh, arrive at the, uh, 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 at the determination, the conclusion that there is something there that is consistent with the Higgs boson. You can clearly see here this accumulation of data that is not described by the red uh, distribution. And that was one of the channels, one of the ways uh, through which we saw the Higgs boson. You can clearly see in blue, the Higgs boson signal explaining the signal we saw. This, uh, there was another important final state that's when the Higgs boson decays spontaneously to two photons. Again, we cannot say that a particular pair of bosons belongs to the decay of the Higgs boson, but statistically, once you start collecting data, you see this bump here on top of the background only hypothesis, and you cannot explain uh, the data unless you have a new particle, which appeared to be consistent with what we saw in the previous graph. So that's how the discoveries, uh, the discovery of the Higgs boson took place. Of course, we are uh, simplifying the project. Obviously, it was a very complex one. Um, there were people that had been working on had been working on it for decades. I myself had spent about a decade working on it. You see here the, the team of people at the Atlas experiment that participated directly um, in a picture of the New York Times. You see me there. Um, with uh, with a white hair, I got white hair in South Africa. It's not because South Africa is particularly uh, stressful; it's a, it's a natural process uh, of decay. Um, so this was clearly very exciting times, obviously, as you can see by our faces. And a year later, uh, the Nobel Prize was awarded uh, to the theorists, uh, the, the two of them that were still alive at the time, uh, that uh, proposed the mechanism that uh, gives rise to the particle, the Higgs boson. And that happened a year after, uh, about a year and so after the uh, announcement by the experiments was made in 2012. Now, why us? So we yeah, a bunch of physicists that work in Geneva, Switzerland, and, and, and the reason why we were drafted to say, okay, can we help the country uh, deal with this very complex problem is because we deal with very complex questions that require multidimensional analysis, in particular machine learning. Uh, uh, just as an example here, you have uh, the, the front page of, uh, of a document on Atlas. We were, I was part of the team that introduced uh, machine learning for the um, uh, search of the Higgs boson at the LHC 10 years prior. Uh, machine learning was not new in the field. It had been used already in the 90s, but uh, this was the first time that uh, this knowledge was transferred and implemented for the search of the Higgs boson. Uh, at first, of course, you know, people were skeptical that this is going to work, but then over the years, uh, the, the machine learning obviously imposes itself as as a necessity because you have to be efficient, effective uh, in, in doing things. And it became baseline uh, uh, for the discovery of the Higgs boson in 2012. Uh, today, uh, CERN is a powerhouse for um, human capacity development in the area of artificial intelligence through machine learning and, and big data. Uh, our students, not just in South Africa, obviously, but worldwide. Uh, and just to give you a scale, each experiment has about 1,200 uh, PhD students at any given time. Um, that the uh, many of them they are trained in the state of the art of uh, machine learning as we know it today. And machine learning has made a lot of progress in terms of the the different techniques and uh, algorithms that. Uh, that are used uh, for data analysis. And this is one of the reasons why, um, you know, we are generously funded by our government in that all our graduates uh, find jobs in, in, in top institutions and companies in the country. And we effectively have uh, zero unemployment uh, when someone finishes this training. Um, so this brings us to COVID-19. So we are a bunch of people 
uh, that A, uh, work in a, in a highly collaborative environment because we need input, not just from physicists, obviously, but we need mathematicians, we need data scientists, we need uh, epidemiologists and clinicians to come in. It's a very complex uh, picture that we have to uh, address. We are used to data analysis. We are technically speaking uh, also data scientists and we are used to dealing with machine learning and, and implementing machine learning to solve problems. Not as much uh, to develop machine learning techniques or develop the mathematics underlying it, but in using effectively these methodologies to solve problems, that's what, what we are good at. And that basically led us to create uh, back in the beginning of um, 2020, a, a Southern Africa consortium of scientists in the country from different uh, universities in South Africa, but also colleagues from uh, Botswana, Eswatini, former Swaziland, uh, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, uh, and Namibia, basically every single country that was neighboring, that is neighboring uh, South Africa, except for Lesotho, we had, uh, we couldn't find a team to, uh, uh, to work with there. And uh, we basically started developing a bunch of tools that later were the knowledge of which is transferred from country to country and is used by different uh, governments, as you will see in a minute. Um, and now, uh, because of our, and thanks to our collaboration with York University and the fact that uh, we were able to, uh, uh, to get funding from the Canadian IDRC, uh, this operation is morphing into the Africa Canada Artificial Intelligence Data Modeling Consortium. And I want to thank uh, Yud Kong uh, for uh, leading the, the application that, uh, that ended up being successful. And then we signed a, a bunch of docu documents and, and, and memoranda uh, between the different institutions. So now let's, let's now focus on the project. And I think this is something that I'm going to, you know, th this, this presentation is really for a broad audience, including policymakers, because it's very important. And over the past year, we've learned how to convey uh, uh, information, how to convey recommendations from a, a scientific environment and, uh, and to, to a, a, a policy maker uh, uh, making environment. And the fact of the matter is that policymakers are extremely smart, uh, but we need to basically establish a line of communication back and forth in order to learn from them and as being able to issue recommendations, not as simply say, look, we've learned obviously through going through crisis and going through very, very intense uh, debates. Uh, with uh, with the community. So the, the first thing that the project really starts with visualization. That's extremely important because visualization gives context uh, as to where we stand in terms of numbers and it, it provides the first uh, intuition. Uh, we, we launched a, a collaborative uh, uh, project following the collaborative model of CERN in Geneva, uh, where we were able to um, uh, create dashboard, not just in South Africa, but in Botswana, Eswatini, Mozambique, uh, Zimbabwe, and Namibia, and Nigeria. Um, and this became fruitful collaborations in that uh, the local teams were able to launch and maintain and interact with us and with their own policymakers. As a matter of fact, these dashboards became the official dashboards of Botswana and uh, Namibia as we were becoming also the official uh, analysis team for the Hauteng uh, province. And this project won uh, the first uh, award of the IEEE uh, Humanitarian Activities Committee. Um, and, and that was announced uh, by them at the time. Um, the, the dashboard has a structure. We keep adding more and more features. Uh, in fact, it's a bit of, we have now new features that includes a bunch of stuff that is important for South Africa, such as mobility, uh, stringency indexes of, of non-pharmaceutical interventions issued by government, the risk for SECO now if they're waived and things like that, global predictions to train our mathematics to work in other countries so that the mathematics are validated before we use it in South Africa and other countries, the dashboards I mentioned, and also economic modeling. We also show, monitor how the economics basis bounces back uh, into, into something closer to equilibrium. Um, one of the examples of the nicest looking um, dashboards, and in fact, in, uh, is in Eswatini, former Swaziland, and this is a very beautifully laid out 
um, website, we gave them the template and then they developed it further. And that's how the collaboration took off. And this is also uh, uh, a, a very important guide um, to understand the details of what happens with the pandemic and where it is in Eswatini. Uh, the South African dashboard uh, has become, um, uh, is not necessarily used by the broad public, you know, because the public wants to have something on a cell phone and wants to see a, a quick graph. This is a, an analytics website that is um, viewed by basically uh, many policymakers in the country, many doctors. So it's, it's, it's used by specialists. We have about 10,000 hits uh, a day. So we make the, the, the clear, uh, uh, we had a clear intention not to become, so to say, the dashboard for uh, visualization for the broad public. That's done by uh, newspapers and, and outlets uh, of the sort, but rather to provide an, an analytics site for policymakers and any specialist to follow the pandemic. Um, and you have a lot of visualizations of different aspects of, of uh, data that government makes public and then uh, uh, through as these numbers go out and is visualized and many people look at it on a daily basis. So in terms of, of modeling, um, <clears throat> within the context now of the work, and now everything we're gonna show from now on is uh, some of the projects we've delivered to the provincial government and the way it works, uh, the, the, you have, a, uh, a national structure that deals with the, the, the problem of the pandemic at large. And then uh, this is, of course, steered through the Minister of Health. But when uh, there are important decisions, such as changing from one level to the other, or making uh, advice or issuing advisories, or, or things that will affect uh, the country at large, the provinces are us. And this is where we come in. We come in, we issue advice and, and uh, advice and, um, and uh, uh, basically recommendations to the provincial government uh, and the premier takes that forward uh, to the to cabinet. That's basically how, how the interaction between the central government and the province. Uh, and uh, the model that we used uh, in order to provide uh, models to uh, the provincial government was based on what we call a, du uh, uh, a, a dual SIRD. Uh, S uh, stands for susceptible, I infected, R recovery, and the, the dead. So it's a, it's a classical compartment um, model, uh, but because this pandemic is specific in that most of the cases of people that are infected, whether they are asymptomatic or uh, they have mild symptoms, don't interact with the healthcare system. Uh, they, uh, they don't go for tests, they are not tested, uh, so to say. So we only see, a f uh, because of, of the fact that only a small fraction of the population interacts with the healthcare system, we know about them and we test them. Um, and in South Africa, there's a, a additional factors that I'm not going to get in. Uh, the, we felt that the, the, the most appropriate modeling that would be the simplest, but at the same time uh, uh, being able to accommodate uh, this issue, this uh, specific characteristic of the pandemic is to do a dual one, not a simple but a dual one SIRD model to model the, what happens at the surface of things what we are able to see through interaction with the healthcare system and then the evolution of the pandemic that is hidden from us uh, that obviously uh, forces uh, the population to go towards herd immunity. And in South Africa, we're actually very advanced in that path. And these lines are basically are going to be elements in this uh, differential equations that we've got here. These are first order differential equations. We've also attempted uh, to modify them using uh, second order uh, differential equations to take into account accelerations due to the fact that as we have seen in South Africa and elsewhere, we have been able to stop the pandemic at a certain point before we reach uh, the uh, herd immunity. And that's a very important uh, byproduct of the fact that there is a very strong societal reaction when the numbers are very high, then when the numbers are high, people become all of a sudden highly aware that this is uh, there's something going on and they, they, they recuse themselves from unnecessary social interaction. That's why we have these ups and downs, not because we have new waves. We basically have surges within a, a bigger wave. So 
But anyway, because we calibrate constantly, we're able to give answers to policymakers that they ask con uh, continuously. In fact, uh, the, this uh, addresses concerns and um, calculations by government as to how many beds will be required. Uh, we be, were able to give answers in regard to the first wave and the second wave now that is uh, coming to an end in South Africa and the third that will be uh, following. And this gap analysis that policymakers have to make to ensure that the province has enough resources and enough beds to deal with uh, the pandemic. And how many do they need as a function of time? So this, is, this offers practical solutions. Um, and, and uh, to those answers. Now, the important parameters here, because the pandemic is, is, is strongly tied to societal behavior. What we did is we, uh, we built a model within this dual SRID that takes into account the um, stringency of non-pharmaceutical interventions and the level of adherence of the population to those. Uh, in order to address the first question, we adapted a methodology developed by Oxford University to the South African context and developed our own South African stringency index. And we were really able to answer the question that policymakers were asking in saying, what happens if we close schools or we open them, but we close something else? So we were able to, um, to, uh, to give quantitative answers, not just sex, but quantitative answers as to what happens uh, with the what if, which is very important for policymakers. And alpha, because obviously we're dealing with a very complex system, it really speaks to the efficiency of the non-pharmaceutical interventions, and that's measured on a regular basis. It's very difficult to come up with a, a statement as to how, what is the efficiency or what is the fraction of the population that wears masks as a function of time. It's very difficult to do that, even with social sentiment. So you have to measure that. This is why our approach is same and critical. And then you're able to make projections. This is just one example from one of our older uh, documents. And we're able to tell uh, policymakers the, about the height of the peak, when the peak will, uh, will take place, if, what happens if your non pharmaceutical interventions are loosened, et cetera, et cetera. So this brings me to what I already uh, indicated is the fact that we developed a, a stringency index of non pharmaceutical interventions in South Africa, and that has played a central role for us to give answers to policymakers as to the what if. Um, yeah, we have a website with everything, all of this is, is documented and we have already also a paper that was submitted and still been reviewed uh, by an international journal where uh, we mod modify the Oxford methodology and we uh, implement the specifics of South Africa according to the different types of measures and the different weights that those measures have. And then you establish a, a a matrix of, uh, that includes time of how these change uh, on, on the basis of the fact that the South African government established a five level uh, risk um, approach. When we go five, level five is complete lockdown, level one is the lowest level of lockdown uh, and level zero means we are back to normal. And we needed to quantify the uh, the stringency of each level as a function of time. There's a complicated question, for instance, pertaining to schools and, and things like that. And you have to quantify all, all that and embed it into the model. For instance, one of the practical, um, one of the practical um, implications of, of the modeling is that we were able to tell when we thought we were ready to loosen restrictions. For instance, this was an example of a a presentation we gave uh, on TV uh, in the context of a seminar organized by the Minister of Health, where we said, look, uh, we are here, and uh, because we've seen a certain improvement in uh, the efficiency of the non-pharmaceutical non intervention, now you are able to uh, loosen uh, the non-pharmaceutical intervention. And we were able to give a quantitative statement through an inequality that the conditions to loosen the, um, uh, uh, the transition. This was, I think, uh, mid last year when, and this was shown on TV, where we said, look, uh, this is where we, where we are at level four. We are ready to go to level three because this inequality is working. So we're able to give a prescription not just thumb sacks, but just a prescription to government officials to say, now we can do it because this makes mathematic sense mathematically. Um, then we are able to model this. Let's look at the, um, 
uh, the red points. This is the number of COVID-19 cases back in May. That was before our first wave. You can see that modeling works fairly well. Uh, recoveries and I mean, those are two, they are anti-correlated, so they're not important. But then at the end, you can see, and this is, we'll, uh, we'll, we're going to be talking about a, a different topic in modeling, which is hotspots. So uh, the, the surges are going to be dominated by hotspots. So the, uh, the, the domestic transmission is an stochastic process of people interacting with each other and passing the virus from one to the other. But then you, it, it is when hotspots are created that you have an acceleration in the cases and that you have to introduce a different modeling uh, to, to follow it and make predictions. So um, for instance, if, we, if you uh, fast forward in time, this graph was uh, corresponding to May, you clearly saw that the prediction of, of, uh, of this simple stochastic transmission was, was very far away from the data. That's because about two thirds of the cases were driven by hotspots. And hotspots are mini pandemics. You cannot use, and it's very difficult to think of, okay, you can do averages, of course, but it's very difficult to model a seriously hotspots on the basis of an average behavior of a province because hotspots is the result of the interaction of individuals in communities and South Africa is very heterogeneous uh, in, in, in the way we interact among each other. There's a lot of variation, social, economic, and, and racial and, and whatnot. So it's clear that the hotspots needed to be studied in detail in order for us to understand the pandemic. So we were, at that point, we moved from the stochastic approach, uh, which describes obviously well the pandemic at, uh, at a certain point into the more microscopic level. And that brings us to the hotspots using artificial intelligence. So the, uh, the, the branch of machine learning we use here is unsupervised learning where we make the least amount of assumptions as to how cases in the province or geospatially uh, are distributed. You just make very basic assumptions as to uh, density functions using Gaussians, but that's basically it. Other than that, you allow the uh, artificial intelligence algorithm to run through the data and create uh, geospatial areas where there are clusters of, um, of positive cases, and then you look at them uh, in detail. And that, that played a role, and I will say why, uh, a very important role, A, because um, you have policymakers looking at the map on a daily basis and deciding whether this requires an intervention or not. But as we will see in a minute, and one of the reasons why the Houghton province uh, has had less cases than what we thought, and we, we were verified that through social media is that people were sharing the pictures of the website left and right saying, careful, you know, in our region, in our ward, or in our district, there is a lot of cases, you know, be careful. And that has helped uh, a lot in curbing uh, the second wave. Uh, which was smaller than the first, as opposed to other provinces. So we developed a project with IBM. Um, IBM has a laboratory. IBM has two laboratories in South Africa, sorry, in Africa. One is in Kenya, the other one is in Johannesburg. And that laboratory was developed by IBM um, in, um, next to Vicks University. So we have close ties with IBM. So our modeling, this, our geospatial model um, using AI, uh, was passed along to them and they developed a, a tool for visualization. Um, and this was basically a three party uh, collaboration. It is, it continues to be between the Houghton Province Department of Health and the Office of the Premier, IBM and us, where they visualize our modeling. And then you have this very fancy tool where you can zoom in, zoom out and look at the characteristics uh, and the location of hotspots. Um, we also provide, which is very important for policymakers, a risk index, how severe is the hotspot, how dangerous it is. Uh, and that speaks to how fast it's uh, developing, how it deviates uh, from uh, historical trends, uh, how fast it does deviate from historical trends and things like that. And it's a number basically that, go, that basically grows and as it grows, it becomes more severe. So we provided that uh, as well. So this has been uh, shown on, on, on mass media and the social media and radio, TV, uh, many, many times uh, in the province where people can see following a color code, 
how severe the hotspots are and where those hotspots are. Of course, I mean, this audience is not South African, so this is Johannesburg, and obviously a person living in Johannesburg say right away, aha, I don't know, I know what's going on, I know where things are, are, are developing and, and so on and so forth. You develop this intuition uh, very, very quickly. Um, for instance, one of the important concerns because of the way the pandemic evolves, um, um, because the second wave was the result of uh, super spread events uh, that took place during the, uh, at the end of the scholar year, huh? there was a geographical bias as to where uh, the, the first cases appear. So people thought that um, because the pandemic showed off and started in more affluent areas, that it wouldn't affect uh, less affluent areas. But then because the, the pandemic evolves geospatially, we were able to show, look, you know, you have a lot of less affluent areas affected. We have to pay a lot of attention to that. And people in those less affluent areas need to take action and recuse themselves from unnecessary, um, uh, unnecessary social interaction. Tembisa is a very, very well-known area that is not so affluent, Alexandra, and Soweto and, and all that. And then you start seeing the, the reality of where the pandemic is and how it moves. And that's very important for both policymakers and the, uh, and, um, the population. Okay, I think uh, I'm gonna skip this because uh, in the interest of time, um, this basically is an analysis of hotspots. I'm gonna touch quickly upon the risk index. So the, the, the South African Defense Force because they are also involved in helping government, they requested an index that would speak to the risk or the probability of new waves. We were, this was developed in the interim period between the first wave and the second wave. Now, the, now that we are past the second wave, this would be used to make a diagnostic of the, the third wave. Uh, so we developed some uh, not so complicated math, but it was robust enough and on the basis of a frequentist the study we were able to establish what is the meaning of a value of that index in terms of probability. What we did is we developed uh, this methodology for about 100 uh, countries and um, states of the United States to, to basically verify the mathematic works. And then we applied the, with, obviously with the specific uh, South African parameters, uh, this thing in the South African context. And then this is, updated on a daily basis. You can follow and policymakers can follow uh, the, the risk for the second wave. Now it is about uh, the risk of resurgence. That would be the third. And you can see, uh, you can uh, zoom in. There's an interactive map here of South Africa. Uh, then you can go into the different districts of, of uh, Gauteng. Uh, then you can go into the sub-districts of the districts, whether it is Johannesburg, Swani, or the Kurlenian, and see which regions have higher or less risk for, of resurgence and where they are in terms of the risk of a, a, a third uh, wave. So let me uh, conclude my talk with uh, a, a hot topic. As you know, the vaccination is, is highly debated. It's probably the most intensively debated subject in South Africa today. Uh, and it has to do with a combination of factors. One of them is the fact that we are dealing with a scarcity. Okay, and let's not get into the details as to details as to why this scarcity is a very complex global problem. Uh, but the reality is that we as scientists and advisors have to take into account the reality uh, that there is going to be a slow, a slow rollout of the vaccination in South Africa. And uh, this is, uh, has become, as we will see in a minute, a classical example of how artificial intelligence through semi-supervised semi machine learning comes to help in addressing a fundamental question. So um, the, the, the strategy of vaccination in South Africa is a phased one, where during phase one, uh, we are going to first vaccinate healthcare workers, frontline workers will follow in phase two, and in phase two B, we're gonna be vaccinating a uh, population with risks of developing severe, um, severe uh, uh, disease, which means in our definition, people that are susceptible or have high probability of getting into an ICU, high care, or unfortunately pass on. And this is a critical step because uh, obviously you can have an idea prima facie 
of who are the people that are most susceptible, but it is only through an artificial intelligence analysis and multivariate analysis they realize which are the classes of people that are most at risk of developing severe disease on the basis of the data. And, and then of course, eventually phase three would come back, but there's a lot of debate because of, as you've seen already on, on the news, uh, the news broke out on, on Sunday, uh, pertaining to the role of, uh, of the strains and the efficacy uh, of the strains against mild uh, symptoms and, and so on and so forth. So of course, phase three at some point will provide herd immunity or not, we will see. But now our focus is to really ensure that with limited resources and limited um, uh, gaps, we are able to help as many people as possible to reduce mortality and hos severe hospitalization to the, to the maximum. For that, we've developed an integrated approach in collaboration with York University, now funded by the IDRC. I'm not going to get into the details, but of course, you know, one, uh, you know, obviously, when you when you think about something and you want it to be perfect, you, you, you include a lot of stuff, but reality comes in. And I was placed in the committee uh, to specifically help government and formulate how we're going to roll out. And then you realize how difficult the whole thing is, and you have to give answers within days. We're basically, you know, uh, having long weekends with uh, very little sleep because uh, government needed a plan uh, to take to, to all the stakeholders to really arrive at a, a, a comprehensive view of what we're going to do. And then you realize that, that you, have to, uh, you have to come up with a streamlined solutions. Now, South Africa is a very complex ecosystem because it has a lot of vulnerabilities, at the same uh, social vulnerabilities that are connected with severe outcomes. So how to balance those, how to implement those into a, a holistic approach that can have practical implementation. Obviously we can write papers about the best way of doing it, but you have to give a solution. So uh, through very, very intense, I have to say, I, and I really enjoyed my work with my colleague policymakers in, uh, in, in the province and practitioners, we decided to split the problem of of, um, of, of delivery of vaccination uh, through two streams. The first stream that would uh, allow for social vulnerabilities to come into play. And we have provided a geospatial distribution of vulnerabilities that exist already uh, following WHO um, guidelines and considerations. And then provide at the same time a smart algorithm based on artificial intelligence that would take out uh, that would basically give you a statement of probability of a person given age, given comorbidities, to develop severe AIDS. In combining both, you basically try to bridge the gap between uh, the, the, a, a pure, so to say, uh, an approach that would not take into account vulnerabilities from one that would take it completely. So this is really what we have recommended uh, government. Um, and then because we had access prior to that to multidimensional data from government, especially the Department of Health, we're able to develop a, a, a deep neural network algorithm to differentiate between uh, severe illness and not so severe illness using semi-supervision approach uh, approaches. If we have time after the presentation, I can discuss uh, the details of it. But the, the bottom line is that we have not the most efficient, but uh, an efficient enough algorithm to tell government uh, what is the probability of a citizen to develop severe illness, because that's what we want to uh, suppress and curb as much as we can. So that leaves us uh, with a graph that has also been shown on TV and has been circulated uh, among the different stakeholders, which is basically a graph that is speak to uh, how, how many people do you have to vaccinate in order to suppress severe disease. So on the x-axis, you have the fraction of the adult population, zero is zero and one is hundred percent. And on the uh, y-axis, you have the reduction of severe disease where zero is zero reduction and one is hundred percent. So if you take into account the fact that, uh, that there is, um, based on the data, of course, we, uh, we take data from from hospitals and so on and so forth. We know we have a matrix of 11 different comorbidities, age and other factors that we know that there is a relatively small fraction of the population that, uh, that has a high probability to develop uh, a, a severe illness. So as a figure of merit, if we were to vaccinate 20% 
of the uh, of the adult population, um, then you would be able to reduce severe illness by about a factor of five or more than 80%. And you do that in a way that you categorize the population according to risk, um, uh, according to risk. And I'm going to uh, obviously skip a lot of detail, obviously risk, this is basically an age distribution of patients that develop severe disease as a function of risk. Of course, age plays a very important role and the machine learning picks it up right away. So if we go from most risk to least risk, of course, the age uh, goes to the right. But for instance, when it comes to uh, uh, comorbidities, uh, you realize that those people and that the are at most risk don't just have one comorbidity, they have in the average three comorbidities. And then you realize that it is the correlation of multiple comorbidities, of course, things like hypertension, diabetes, and, um, and, and cardiac disease that is going to really create that, that uh, that problem for the person. And, and then you're basically able to say, okay, if we had say a few hundred thousand jabs, who should we uh, give them uh, to first that you basically are able to give an answer based on the data, not based on assumptions that it would be people above say 60 years of age and have multiple comorbidities because those folks would have the highest, uh, the highest probability of, of uh, developing a serious disease. And this is an example of the recommendation we provided last week to, uh, uh, to provincial government for the phase two, uh, phase, for the phase two deployment of the vaccine. Remember, we just starting phase one. We, uh, we are starting to vaccinate frontline workers. So we have to be obviously proactive and be ready for when more vaccines will come. And then what we did is we provide, uh, obviously, what you don't want to do is to give an inner network to a policymaker. You have to give a classification. So you have to turn that inner network into a uh, discrete distribution of groups uh, where the people that have the highest risk are people not just uh, older than 60, but have a particular type of comorbidities. And then you give an estimate based on multidimensional data of the population of how many people that would be. So you can answer the question, uh, suppose we have a limited amount of vaccines, who should we uh, vaccinate first? And then you go down the line and you end up here with group four, which would be anybody uh, age 18 or more with any comorbidity, which in South Africa, of course, it includes HIV and, 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 and TB, but all the probabilities of, of how TB and HIV enhance severe disease are embedded in the data through, uh, through the machine learning. So this is Basically, the last slide, and it gives an example of how we provide advice uh, to government to deal with such a complicated question that has so so many uh, parameters and and dimensions. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't run over my time too much. No, uh, um, Bruce, you, you're right on time. Thank you very much for bringing us from physics to epidemics and to the recovery of the vaccination. Um, so we have a number of questions on the line. Um, uh, maybe we can start with Michael uh, Wolfson. Hello, Michael. can you hear me okay? Yes, very well. Oh, thank you very much, a fascinating uh, talk. Um, the model with, with the dual uh, SIR or whatever it was, it has the part that's observed and a part that's not observed. How much did the um, actual fitting or estimation of the model depend on just where the uh, testing was going on. For, you, know, you mentioned something at one point that uh, it looked like most of the cases were in uh, higher affluent areas, but then after a while, uh, they moved to others, uh, Soweto or whatever. Was that because uh, of a change in the location of uh, an intensity of, of testing? And when I get another turn, I have a second question. Right. Uh, you're asking an extremely good question because that really speaks to what we have to deal with. So um, the, the model itself gives you a, a temporal evolution. So a, 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 it gives you a time dependent answer of how many cases you expect in the average, because this is, this is basically a, a stochastic process. So this is what you're going to do. Now, as you said, as you correctly uh, pointed out, the pandemic doesn't evolve homogeneously in space. It moves from regions from regions to other regions. 
Now we have, in addition to, uh, to, to the issue of model, we have these very complex societal interactions and perceptions, because sometimes some uh, sectors of society may think that, well, you know, this is a problem of the rich and doesn't affect us. But then you have to really explain how the, and also verify to the public and policymakers how this moves from one to the other to the point that it always affects everybody. So you can think of the modeling having two components. One is the temporal component that the differential equations give you. And then you have the geospatial model where artificial intelligence comes in to tell you where the, the pandemic is located. Thank you, Bruce. Maybe the next one is from Kevin, Kevin Brown. And uh, Kevin, maybe you can ask a question directly. Oh, I, I guess I, I guess I just had a question about like how um, you know how comorbidities get classified in South Africa. I mean, there's it's it's really not maybe in my mainstream research in North America, uh, but. Uh, um, somebody called Michael Wenberg does a lot of uh, uh, kind of classification uh, research on how if you move from a low um, healthcare resource utilization part of the United States to a high resort healthcare resource utilization part of the, the United States. So if you move from, um, you know, from, from Minnesota to California, you gain X comorbidities on average within a few years. And if, if on the other hand, you move from um, from California to Minnesota, you actually lose a whole bunch of comorbidities over the co course of a few years. So I guess I was wondering how that plays out in a country like um, South Africa, where you just have some people that simply don't have access to health care. Right. Okay. So the, there's two questions here. First is our ability to understand the distribution of comorbidities in the country, and in particular in the province. So we're so lucky that a survey uh, was performed and was concluded right before the, um, the pandemic broke out. And we, uh, there was this institution that is funded by government and our university that ran a survey of uh, vulnerabilities, social vulnerabilities that included a, a matrix of comorbidities. And that allowed us to have an understanding um, of what, I mean, the very latest distribution of comorbidities in the province, uh, because the data was basically, uh, you know, as good as 2019, beginning of 2020. So that gives us an understanding of what is a fraction of the population uh, with uh, comorbidities such as uh, hypertension and diabetes, which are the two leading, so, uh, two leading factors leading to, um, um, to um, uh, severe disease. The, the issue of AIDS, TB is very well understood in South Africa, it's very well surveyed, but of course it was good to have in a comprehensive uh, uh, matrix. Now, that basically allowed us to have a picture of uh, where and how many people are susceptible to severe disease as a result of age and uh, comorbidities. Now, this obviously, this data includes everybody in the province, because even people live in less affluent areas. So it was, it was basically uh, trying to have a, a complete cross section of what's going on uh, in the province. Now, you have to add to that, as you currently point out, in a country like South Africa, uh, it, it's a very complex societal ecosystem where uh, not everybody has access uh, to or goes to the healthcare. There are also certain sentiments that uh, for which people don't want to go to the healthcare system. I mean, the second wave has been a very good example of the fact that we we never reach full occupancy, yet uh, the uh, as as is now known, very well known, um, uh, excess mortality in South Africa is fairly high compared to the official number. So we know that there is a fraction of the population developing severe illness that don't go or don't engage with the healthcare system and they pass on. And the only way to get access to the statistics is unfortunately through um, certificates of, of, of disease. And we know that it's significantly greater than the official uh, tally. Okay, it's, it's open public information. I'm not saying uh, really anything. So you have to really 
take into account all those. So as a result of all, this, uh, all these factors, what we decided to develop is not a model of mortality, but rather a model of severe disease for which we have a lot more data because there's also ICU and, and high care and mortality because the, 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 our ability to understand the picture of mortality is hindered by the fact that not everybody has access or wants to, uh, to engage with the healthcare system. So these are the kind of difficulties we have to deal with and, and, and try to give practical solutions to in the South African context. Good, um, thank you. Um, David, David and Mayberry, uh, you raise your hand. Do you want to ask questions directly? Uh, yes, thank you very much, Bruce. Thank you very much for your presentation. I, I'm, to be honest, to, I'm disappointed with the standard model continuing to survive so well at the LHC as a high theorist for many years. And uh, the standard model just keeps on working. Thank you very much for the presentation on the uh, on the Higgs boson. Um, the question I have is um, about the hotspot area that you you uh, that you that you did. Um, are you using any multi-level or hierarchical modeling that leads to sort of Bayesian shrinkage, or is it just a straightforward? Is it more of an app, straightforward application of uh, of uh, hierarchical cl uh, clustering? Are you using any shrinkage techniques at all? Okay, uh, I have to remember the details. Um... We used, um, we, we attempted few uh, clusterization algorithms like K-clustering and all that. Um, I can pass you the technical document that we, we, we are putting together to answer. I don't know off the top of my head. I think we, we concluded that one of them was basically working best or was most stable. And it's basically a, um, uh, it wasn't particularly, uh, so to say, a complex clusterization algorithm. I think he uses, uh, Gaussian functions and uh, yeah, the, um, yeah I, 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 okay, I would have to give you the technical document to answer that question. In, in particular. Okay, all right, yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, David. Uh, Neri, Neri, raise your hand. Uh, Neri Namus. Yes, first, thank you very much for the talking. Um, first, I want to to add, we can change the output of the infection if we get infected with the minimum inoculum because it is not the same thing if one person is infected with one viral particle that a person that is infected with 1,000 viral particles because you know each time that we get infected, we are going to have an immunological response and the, the growth of the immunological response that we have against the SARS-CoV-2 in this case is an exponential function, but also the replication of the virus is an exponential function. So if we compare the two functions, well, let's say three functions. Let's say we compare the exponential function of the replication of the virus, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, in a person that got infected with one viral particle. And we compare that with the exponential growth of the immunological response that that person is going to have. If we compare those, um, those exponential function, the immunological response is going to be greater than the reproduction of the virus. But if the person is infected with 1,000 viral particles, then the exponential function is, is a lot greater than the immunological response that the person is going to have. So one thing is try of not get infected with the virus. But other thing is that if we are going to get infected, we need to get infected with the minimum amount of of the virus in order to the exponential function of the immunological response don't be um, overwhelming by the better replication of the virus. That was one point. Um, the other point was comparing the, the rate of mutation of the HIV versus the mutation rate of the SARS-CoV-2. So first, um, let me make clear this point. Many people think that the mutations are advantage for, in this case, for the virus. And no, the most, the majority of the mutations are not advantage for the, for the virus or for the human or whatever. The great amount of the mutations are disadvantage, but there are very few mutations that are advantage. And in this case, the SARS-CoV-2 is not, is not mutating or the advantage is not mutating because if the virus get a mutation, probably is going to be disadvantage. So that is one issue. And the advantage of the virus and of every living thing, well, the virus is not living, but of everything 
is to get the greater amount of copies of the genes in the next generation. So what is advantage for the virus is not to produce a very severe disease in order to the people die, because if the people die, then the virus is also going to die and they are not going to be copies of the virus in the next generation. So what is advantage for the, for the SARS-CoV-2 in this case is to produce an infection that we yeah. not, excuse me. Yeah, so you might, the question might be too long that I don't think uh, the speaker can catch up. What is, is the any, question? What is the question? Uh, can you, the question is, that, and just correct me if it is wrong that what I'm saying, but the question is, is different the uh, mutation rate of the HIV, of the HIV versus the mutation rate of the SARS-CoV-2? Because in the SARS-CoV-2, the advantage of the SARS-CoV-2 is to produce an infection that is not severe enough in order to the people not dying. But the HIV, the, um, the rate of mutation is a lot greater because we have the uh, protease inhibitors, the interest inhibitors, and the advantage of the virus is to have mutations in the genes that codify for that enzymes in order to not, well, in order to continue replicating in a human. So correct me if I'm wrong, but is different the rate of mutation of the HIV versus the rate of mutation of the SARS-CoV-2. The advantage of the HIV is that it has a lot of mutations. The advantage of the SARS-CoV-2 is that it has not a lot Eric. of mutations. No, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the next is time for two, one hour. Is there any way you can email me your questions that I can forward it to the speaker? Maybe we can have a more effective communication on this. Okay, uh, thanks. Yeah, so I, so send me email. Uh, my email address is public available uh, along the uh, website. So you can probably, that will be more efficient. I'll make sure that one is transferred to the speaker and uh, uh, facilitate the discussion on that part. And um, uh, there are still a number of questions uh, from the audience, but I think uh, give the timing. So I will I, I record the name and the person I will try to to moderate the discussions further. After uh, this session, I want to again take this opportunity to, to thank first of all the speaker, but also would like to thank our PHAC Public Health Agency Canada colleague for allowing, uh, for accommodating this, this uh, joint seminar. So uh, with that, I, again, on behalf of the Fields Institute and the task force, I want to uh, thank Bruce uh, for coming I know it's the evening time and uh, for congratulate you for, for lots of very influential work. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Thanks a lot, eh? Thank you.